G'day guys, Mac here with The Outer Circle, and today I'm going to be actually recording the first ever audio commentary for the film Prometheus. Um, obviously it's not the first commentary for the film, but the first for this YouTube channel. Such is life. A um, couple of warnings first off the bat, I might swear, and we do have a new puppy in the house, and the missus is a bit loud when she's disciplining the puppy at the moment, so if you do hear her in the background, I apologise, but you know, such is life. Um, I'll be starting the commentary as soon as the 20th Century Fox logo comes up, and the version of the film is the 2012 uh, Blu-ray release. It is not the 3D, not extended cut, not director's cut, anything like that. Just a standard theatrical cut. So, enjoy. Alright, starting at the 20th Century Fox logo in 3, 2, 1. Now. Lovely blue version of the 20th century logo there. Dune Entertainment. Don't know much about Dune Entertainment. I do like the Scott Free logo um, at the start of Ridley Scott's films, how it's like an oil canvas painting. It's more interesting than some. I think ones I don't like, I don't like uh, Bad Robot, which is J.J. Uh, Abrams' company. I do really like the uh, music in this film. Really sets the mood. It's not as good as Jerry Goldsmith's music. Um, the original Alien, I still think, has the best soundtrack. Um, visually, this is probably the most beautiful film. Although, Alien 3, that was a beautiful film. Uh, for all its faults, and it has a lot of faults, Alien 3, but um, for some reason I still love it anyway. Contrary to popular belief, the film was not actually written by Damon Lindelof of Lost. It was actually mostly written by a guy I believe called John Spates. Um, this is his first proper feature film that he wrote. Um, Lindelof came in like 90% of the way through the writing process. And if you know what he's like, he probably added a lot of the clusterfuck shit to the end of this film. Again, just stunning cinematography. I believe it was Janusz Kamczynski um, did the cinematography for the film. Very talented cinematographer. Um, has also done other films like um, oh, fuck, Mental Blank Crystal King, The Crystal Skull, the fourth Indiana Jones film. Um, no, sorry, Darius, Darius Wilczowski, something like that. Anyway, point is, great cinematography. Absolutely beautiful. So, this ship we see at the start of the film here, um, traveller ship over the waterfalls with the um, engineer beings is a completely different type of ship to the uh, croissant, to the dreadnought. Um, again, because engineer technology sometime between we're assuming this is, you know, before the dinosaurs, so we're talking at least 100 million BC. Obviously, their UFOs, um, their ships have changed over time because their technology on the engineers itself has progressed. Maybe not a great deal, but it has. The scene was originally uh, longer at the start of the film with um, the engineer finishing a discussion with several older engineers. Um before going to commit his ritual. I do quite like the design. Um, they talk about it in the making ofs. But basically, if you think of the statue David and the Greco-Roman interpretation of how their gods would look, that is how um, how they tried to portray the engineers. So they're like that alabaster marble. Um, you know, they've got that strong nose. They look very much like a statue. Um, everything is hyper um, exaggerated in detail. 
Now, it's interesting, this sacrifice scene, because um, it's something else that was also um, trimmed down. It was actually much harder R um, in its original design. What they tried to do here was um, make it look... They made the engineer's DNA look very nasty. How it's this sort of white, almost like fish cartilage. And the point of the black goo was to make the black goo look even nastier. Now, yeah, again, this scene... Um, originally, instead of coming out of his spine there, you were going to come out of his brain. Um, and you'd see, like, all his brain flaking off and skull flaking off and... Um... I don't know, I don't find it too gory. Um, I grew up on horror films, so, you know, each to their own. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I really like this movie. I think that's a great opening intro. Um, it shows the genesis, the creation of life, in a new and interesting way. Um, as opposed to the genesis and creation of life out of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. So, you know, you got options just deleting some files in the background. So, I think it's interesting to note that the start of this film very much reminds me of the film AVP. Um, you know, the whole... They come to, uh, they're, they're foraging around, you know, in ancient sites, just like in AVP, you know, where where um, the Mexican doctors were in that Mayan temple and find the Pepsi lid. Well, in this film, Elizabeth Shaw and that Holloway, I'm going to call that guy, maybe, um, what's he, he's a discount version of, um, was that dude that played Bane and Mad Max? Fuck. Tom Hardy. Yeah, he looks like a discount version of Tom Hardy. Seriously. But, um, yeah, so they find clues to the aliens, right, in the in the pyramids, in um, AVP. Well, here they find clues to aliens and, you know, people who helped humanity with their technology in that, in uh, cave paintings and pyramids. You know, from here, the, the crew will head to a ship. And on that ship, they get a briefing by Mr. Wayland, and there's <laughs> just a few similarities, you know? So, I just thought I'd bring that up, because I found that pretty pretty funny, how, you know, I don't know if it was intentional, um, I definitely wouldn't try and nod to AVP, because I think those films are fucking terrible, um, although the second one is better. The Chariots of the Gods and, um, you know, Aliens Bringing Life to Earth um, is something explored in a few sci-fi genres, or I shouldn't say genres because sci-fi is a genre, um, sci-fi films, sci-fi series, um, Stargate is one that comes straight to mind, I think they did a very interesting take on it, although the continuity between uh, Stargate, the original movie by Roland Emmerich with Kurt Russell and James Spader versus Stargate SG-1. Yeah. Uh, I love this shot, the, especially in the cinema in 3D. Like, I think 3D is a terrible gimmick, but when used to do space scenes, is excellent. Uh, the shot there where you come around the ship and it looks like a planet with the sun rising before you realise it's the engine with the light. Beautiful shot. Something about Ridley Scott. The guy just knows how to make creative visuals. But, yes. Um, the ship itself uh, and space. Space is something that the gimmick of 3D works really well for. Because it gives you an idea of scale. You know, how the background doesn't move and the ship does. And how um, it, you can see infinitely into the distance. Because they often will ramp the 3D up. A great movie for that was Interstellar. I think Interstellar was beautiful in 3D. Um, especially scenes of, like, the black hole and stuff like that. It, oh, it's so much fucking better when you, um, when you view it in 3D. So, now, um, I'll talk more about the ship in a moment, but this dream sequence, I think it's fine to read into it. I do think that 
if you're going to view a dream, it needs to be from a first-person perspective or a flat angle. This whole perfect cutting from one person to another, <laughs> it's not, I don't know, it's not how a dream would play out. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's just a nitpick. The film's not perfect. Um, I think this is a Ford film. I, I think it is probably third or fourth in the franchise for quality. Um, the one thing I know for sure is that Alien Resurrection is last, although it does have some interesting ideas. Unlike the first Alien film where Ash was a government plant, um, the fact that David's an android is never really um, an issue in this film. It's not a, a government plant or an agency or a company or whatever. It's They freely acknowledge that he's a robot. He's just a member of the crew. And his job is to watch over the ship and learn this alien language um, throughout the journey while the humans sleep. You'll notice that he walks around in uh, thongs because as a robot, he doesn't actually have need of shoes. Just an interesting um, creative point. And of course, he eats white gruel because, you know, androids vomit up white gunk. <laughs> I don't know, it's probably some, some sort of synthetic oil or something. I love those copper space suits. They don't wear them in the film, but you can see them in the background. They're beautiful. Um, yeah. Now, people often complain about the Prometheus as a ship um, because it's so sleek and futuristic um, compared to the Nostromo. Now... The thing to remember with the Nostromo is the Nostromo uh, from the original Alien film is it's a cargo hauler. It's just this piece of shit. It's been in operation for probably 50 years, you know, or um, well, for a long time. Um, and the technology on it is what they call retro, retro tech. Um, it's nothing amazing, you know. It's it's just it's designed to to work, to not die. Um, They've used reliable technology in the ship, whereas the Prometheus is is a yacht. It's Wayland's personal yacht. It's his um, the bee's knees of human space kind technology. That's why it's such an impressive vessel. It's got the best of the best, the newest technology on it. And knowing this, I'm totally fine with the fact that the ship is um, that doesn't fit the retro continuity entirely. It's fine for it to look. You know, it's not like the Star Wars prequels. You know, in the Star Wars prequels, all the ships are really sleek and, and they feel sleek and fast. And whereas in um, the original Star Wars films, they didn't. You know, they're these real clunky ships. Um, and people can try and explain that away, but they're talking out their ass. You know, oh, the Empire mass produced TIE Fighter. Yeah, no one gives a fuck. Um, in this, it makes sense. In Star Wars, it didn't. It was just George was just getting carried away with his technology. You see some of the screens that you see on the um, consoles and that they're um, they're sort of retro. Um, they style like old CRT screens. Some of them are flat screens, so it just depends really. The bridge on the ship itself was modelled on um, the original Nostromo drawings. Um, Ron Cobb drew the original Nostromo um, and all the human sort of artwork um, for the original Alien. Ron Cobb, spectacular visual artist. Um, we'll get to Giga later, but um, Ron Cobb, um, yeah, he did uh, work on Conan, he worked on this, I think he did work on Blade Runner. Brilliant conceptual artist. Uh, so, yeah. Ron Cobb, C-O-B-B, -B, if you want to check out some of his work. Fantastic um, visual artist. This is a great scene. There's a deleted scene for this. Um, oh, nice nip-nips, Charlize. Ah. <laughs> um, where she walks in at Michael Fassbender and she says, you know, how long? And he goes, 16 inches, fully erect. Varies when not excited. So, <laughs> that's a great, uh, he's got a wicked sense of humour about him. Now, the idea here is that cryosleep hasn't been, uh, fully 
perfected yet by humanity. Um, everyone, they get like, it's like a hangover coming out of cryo sleep. Your body's, you know, it's in shock. And that's why people are throwing up and stuff like that. And Charlize, um, you see her doing push-ups and that because she's trying to show that she's, um, uh, it's her way of like getting through a hangover type thing, get the body, get adrenaline working, that kind of thing. Idris Elba, criminally underutilized in this and in Star Trek Beyond. I love him in everything he does, but um, criminally, criminally underutilized. Plus, he's like a pretty cool dude, right? <laughs> he looks like the kind of guy where, like, if you go out to the pub with him, you'd have a pretty good time. These guys are both English actors, um, even though uh, bloke on the left, whose name completely escapes me, um, I'm sorry, dude, um, has this like thick American Southern accent. So now, I think I speak for everyone. I say the scientists in this movie seem incredibly dumb and annoying with their actions, but that is explained away. Um, in like the director's audio commentary and that, um, and it is worth noting that because of the distance of this journey, um, it's considered high risk, you know, like um, working in a mine or working as a hired mercenaries in like Fallujah in Iraq. So the people that are doing it are getting a lot of danger pay. These people are not going here. Um, you know, it's one of those things where you sign the contract, you could die going on this journey because you're going further than any human ever has before. You're going four years away from Earth, I believe. Something like that. So, because of that, um, that's why they're dumb scientists because they haven't got the best of the best. They've got the people who are willing to go on the journey. Here is Peter Wayland, as opposed to Charles Bishop Wayland, giving the briefing on the Predator's Temple. Oh, shit, I mean the uh, Prometheus. In the background, you can see um, terraforming going on on Mars. Possibly the first Adeptus Mechanicus stuff going in, you know? So David's basically the son that Wayland never had. Um, which pisses off Charlize because she's his daughter even if she uh, wears pantsuits doesn't make her a dude uh, you know, fight the patriarchy, hashtag Yes, we get it. We get the title of the film is Prometheus. It's about, you know, uh, gods creating technology for humans or some such. So what's Bishop's motivations? Oh, not Bishop. Fuck, Wayland's motivation. Basically, he's an old man, still got his wits about him, wants to not die. That's why he's funding the journey. He wants to find the engineers because he thinks that since they created humanity, they can um, cure him of death. You know, that's a Rubik's Cube they've painted. Come on. Prop design. Prop design's an um, integral part of films, and the props for Ridley Scott's films are pretty good. Overall, he does a fantastic job with every film he does because the guy loves practical effects. Um, I can't exaggerate that enough. He, he didn't go down... It's like James Cameron, you know. The golden age of visual effects was the 1990s. It really was. Um, special effects are, effects that are done in camera on the day. Visual effects are uh, effects that are done later on in the computer. Spielberg, James Cameron... Really, Scott, the best visual effects ever done were all in the 90s. Between films like Titanic, Terminator 2, Jurassic Park, True Lies, they're seamless, the special effects and the, tr and the visual effects. 
unfortunately, uh, The Lord of the Rings, The Lord of the Rings is also from that period. Got to remember it was made in 98, 99 and 2000, The Lord of the Rings, um, with pickup shots accordingly um, down the track. And because of that, um, in those days, a lot of practical effects were still used. And it was only where the practical effects couldn't work, where they, they went digital. Then along come B-movies, you know, um, and George Lucas with his Star Wars prequels, and they just went for full green screen and tried to, and you know, it ends up dating poorly, and it looks like that, what was that Warplane movie with Jude Law and Gwyneth Paltrow? Sky Commander, World of Tomorrow or something? It all comes off looking like that, you know, it doesn't look real, you know, no matter how real they, you think it is at the time, it doesn't look right to your mind's eye um it's the uncanny valley it, it's like when you look at um you watch when i remember when i was like a kid right like 10 years old or something like that or 14 years old and seeing the um opening uh video to the movie uh, to the game quake 2 and thinking fuck yeah this is like hyper realistic this is like big battleship moving through space and watching the drop pods and and then you watch it ten years later and you're like, oh, dude, this looks fucking pixelated as hell. It's horrible. Photorealism changes with time as technology progresses. and Especially as our brains progress and we get older. And um, what's happened now is people are lazy. They're not putting in the effort in a lot of movies into making it photorealistic. You look at the quality of the Hobbit films compared to, um, compared to Lord of the Rings. Like Peter Jackson just got too carried away with the digital effects. And wherever you use the practical stuff, like the dwarves and things like that, and you see them up close, they look fantastic. But when but when you see, you like, you know, that big fight in the end of um, Battle of Five Armies, it just, oh, God, and that wiggle was climbing, oh, fuck. You know, I, you know, I need to do a commentary just for those Hobbit films so I can just bag the fuck out of some of their bad choices. And I like those films, so... <laughs> yeah, it's a med pod calibrated only for men. Why? So that infamous scene can happen later on in this film. I straight off topic a bit there, but that's the nature of commentaries, right? Point was, Ridley Scott films always look fantastic. Excellent visual effects, excellent special effects. They use real sets, they use real props, and it's only when he can't do something in camera that he does, um, geez, easy on the vodka, mate. Um, it's only when he can't do something in camera on the day that he actually does go for the computer and you've got to respect that you know his films like this the martian robin hood gladiator you watch them they all hold up you know blade runner um even legend best devil makeup ever right so ridley scott fantastic visual artist um i still think his best film is alien um I really like Blade Runner, but it's one of those movies where you've got to sit down when you're ready. Um, you got to really want to watch the film on the day. You know, it's not one of those movies you can just chuck on in the background and, you know, because it's, it's, it's a thinking movie, a thinking man's movie, Blade Runner. So this thing here is a signal that they've been, this hologram is a signal they've been beaming to um, this planetoid to this uh, moon constantly um it's kind of like the gold discs um that carl sagan came up with that are on like the pioneer and the voyager spacecraft there's gold record discs that are meant to last like a hundred thousand years or something on those spacecraft so that if another alien race encounters them they'll know a bit about mankind maybe come and see us well same thing with this they're basically beaming a signal directly at the alien moon saying this is who we are, this is our technology, this is what we've accomplished, you know, we're out there. Now it's interesting to note this seems to be our first contact with an alien species. Um, obviously we haven't been going into the void long. Um, but in aliens, it seems like we've encountered several alien species because it's very run-of-the-mill and every day to the crew when they discuss it, so... At some point between these two films, or even between this and Alien, because again, they don't seem to 
weirded out by the crashed ship in Alien, do they? So, at some point between this and then, humanity meets alien species and becomes fine with it, I guess. Just an interesting point of note. Lovely landing sequence. That's Benedict Wong um, in the starboard um, navigation chair or piloting chair. Um, just worth noting, he plays Genghis Khan or Genghis Khan slash Jagatai Khan, if you will. Um, or oh, not Genghis Khan. Who is he? He's um, Kublai. Kublai Khan. In um, the Mongols, Marco Polo um, TV series on Netflix. Not a bad TV series. Worth checking out if you're into that sort of Game of Thronesy y Vikings um, style of stuff. Although the Marco Polo character in it's kind of a fuckwit. <laughs> so all this uh, matte background here is actual digital photography from um, Jordan in the Middle East. And they've computer enhanced it. So again, you've got something real shot in camera. And then all they've done is adding like the clouds and the lightning and taking out any roads or people um, that were on the ground. So all this is an actual valley in Jordan. And they've just digitally manipulated an existing real thing. This is very different to, say, a green screen where you're creating everything from scratch. Um, and you can see it just it has depth, especially when you see it in um, 3D again. Because this is the appropriate use of a 3D camera to provide scale and expand on the visuals. Um, Another point of note is you'll see the, s the windows actually rocking and the consoles rocking independently of one another. This whole set um, of the bridge of the Prometheus was actually built on hydraulic gimbals. Um, and that is why. So it's not like the old Star Trek where everyone just shakes themselves and throws themselves around. Um, in this movie, no, the, the actual ship is actually moving. Um, and it looks great. I don't know why they park so far away from the uh, temple. You could have, like, parked, I don't know, a couple hundred metres closer, half a K closer. Come on. So, um, yeah. Don't like this guy's character. Dr. Holloway. Discount Tom Hardy. Don't like his character. I, I don't know. Just seems like a douchebag. I love Michael Fassbender, though, in everything he's in. I think the earliest film I remember him in was, um... Fuck, what was it? I think it was 300. Now, this Jackson guy with the uh, firearm that they make a big deal about, you know, this is a science, uh, science expedition, we don't need firearms... Yeah, where the fuck is he when they're going to the temple? It's just the scientists. It's like the characters are there and then they're, they're not there. First half of this film is a perfect... Um, perfect movie. Pretty much. Now, what I mean by that is the exposition, the doling out of information to the audience, the building of the suspense, the intrigue, is all on point, right? It's not too slow, it's just the right pace. Um, everything is right. It's the second half of this film that lets it down. Not my little nitpicks um, in the first half, because every film's going to have little nitpicks, right? So it's great little character moments like that, with the two guys sit down and Firefield just moves along. That's actually a Czech um, army truck called a Tetra or Tetra um, that they just put a body kit on. And that looks great. That's that's good prop work. Iceland is great as Alien Worlds. Um, Iceland was also used for. Uh, interstellar 
and they actually found this lake that's like knee deep for half a kilometre and um, that's where they filmed the water world from Interstellar it's very um, primeval Iceland I think it's very beautiful because of that very different to my own country of Australia which is primeval in a completely different everything wants to kill you kind of way so <laughs> take that how you will copper hubcaps look great on that vehicle I love the uh, pyramid has this big giant head skull on top of it no one seems phased by that but whatever I mean, I can see that looking looking up from their perspective. <laughs> now, the thing about these spacesuits is these are not spacesuit spacesuits, right? These are kind of like diving suits. You know, you're in atmosphere. It's just keeping the harmful gases in the atmosphere around you away from you. You know, it's not a pressurized suit. It's just a breathing apparatus. You see, um, when you're in no atmosphere, that's when you need a pressure suit. And obviously a pressure suit is going to be very different to spandex, which these guys are wearing. Um, Ridley Scott makes a good point that, in his opinion, again, because the guy's really smart, um, why in the future would you have a helmet that has blind spots? Traditional helmet makes no sense. Instead, he's created these helmets, which have um, no blind spots on them, which is makes perfect sense. You should be able to turn your head around and see, because again, it's a breathing apparatus. You know, it's a single piece of you know perspex or something like that. Um, obviously, in the future, the technology is there. You know, it could be transparent aluminum. Um, absolutely bulletproof, you know, so, yeah, I'm going to map this place and I'm going to get lost in it, <laughs> one downside of these helmets is it looks great that they're internally lit, um, visually fantastic if it was real life though it would be fucking <laughs> abysmal because you think about it it's like um, when you look out your window at night and you got lights on inside you can't see shit outside right you have to like put your head up against the glass cover you put your hands around your eyes well it's the same thing all those helmets have lights inside so you wouldn't actually see shit out of them would you <laughs> so you'd want to turn off the lights inside the helmet <laughs> i just had to point that out So the first time I watched this film was in the cinemas, a um, whole bunch of mates, a whole bunch of Warhammer mates, um, frankly, or um, a lot of them were also army mates, and I bought like bolt tickets, just bought like a hundred bucks worth of tickets to this film, and I was like, come on, we're all going to see it, um, when I was living in Townsville, everyone was like, yeah, fuck yeah, I'd love to see another alien film, because you only get about one a decade, um, it's not the most prolific series, you know, um, some films, every two, three years you get one. This is not that kind of series. Originally, they were meant to stumble into like a rainforest or a forest underground here and see how the engineers were terraforming this planet. Um... For whatever reason, they dropped that scene. And obviously, yeah, this guy's a douchebag. Oh, I'm just going to take my helmet off. Now, it's fine if you don't sense toxins in the air or, or, you know, the air is breathable. But you don't know what, like, microbacteria is in there or viruses or any of that kind of thing, right? Like, think of the fucking Aztecs. Do you think they... Could smell smallpox in the air when the fucking Spanish landed? No. <laughs> but they fucking knew it when their whole fucking species, or species, sorry, race, the Aztec race, the Aztec peoples, probably knew it when, you know, three quarters of them had died to fucking smallpox. 
Jeez, Benedict Wong, you've chunked up since this movie. Put on a fair bit of weight, mate. Like me. <laughs> I'm getting fat in my old age. Another great thing about Ridley Scott movies is the characters feel like they're actually characters. You know, they actually talk to one another and have just mindless chit chat. Um, Quentin Tarantino probably does it the best in some ways. It's, that his topic, his dialogue, is interesting to listen to. But Alien, um, and to a lesser extent, this film, it feels real. You know, people are talking over the top of one another, and it's a bit chaotic. Which is just like really talking, you know? Now, this scene where David wipes his hands and gets this weird slime between them. It's like, ooh, impressive. I don't know why he says it or what it means. And I'm pretty good at interpreting film and listen to directors' commentaries and stuff. But even I'm like, what? I also don't understand why... I understand how he's able to read the cuneiform script to set off this um, hologram sequence. I don't understand why the engineers, however, are using cuneiform, considering it is an outmoded and primitive form of communication um, and writing. You think they would have come up with something better, you know? <laughs> Some sort of higher species... Higher form of communication. So, you know, whatever. Might just be me. So all of a sudden it becomes like really tense. Like a horror film. People are running and the camera's there. and But it's not tense or horrifying what's going on. It's more intriguing. Um, just a strange music cue I find. Because it, it almost sounds like a really... Subtle scream. Effective, effective music throughout this film. Again, um, music really makes the movie. Um, Jerry Goldsmith's original score um, for Alien is still, I think, the best in the series. Um, and I also really like Howard Shaw, um, his score for um, Aliens. With like the military march now, good good scores. Um, they really set the tone for the movies. Oh, Idris, so criminally underutilized. Idris Elba needs to be given more leading roles. I'd love to see him as James Bond. And people complain about like whitewashing and blackwashing and Asian washing in movies. You know, like with that whole um. Scarlett Johansson as the major in Ghost in a Shell and how she's not Asian. As far as I'm concerned, whoever is just the best actor, give them the role. I don't really give a fuck if it's if it's just a made up story and not a um, canonical character as such. Like you know, if if it was something like you know Vulcan is described as a black man, okay, that's very well established. Then you want to use like you know a black skinned man as Vulcan. Um, but James Bond seems like a character who it doesn't really matter what skin colour he is. The only thing that matters is that he's a chauvinist pig and that he's a man, right? So, a good character. You know? Any good character actor will be fine as James Bond. So, Idris Elba, I'd love to see him as James Bond. So, Firefield and Milburn are scared out by, or scared away by a dead engineer's body. Okay. I still don't understand how the fuck they get lost. <laughs> it makes no fucking sense, right? Um, so, it's hinted. Um, Ridley Scott loves Jesus metaphors and God metaphors. I think he's a religious person. Um, I'm not, for the record. But I've got nothing against people who have a religion, per se. Um, but basically, the hint is that because it happened 2,000 years ago, give or take, you know, that these guys were pissed off at the death of Jesus and that Jesus was possibly an engineer. 
right? And that his miracles were not miracles, but performed by his superior technology. You know, kind of like the Norse um, gods in Marvel Comics, how Thor and the Asgardians, their technology is so superior to ours, it seems like magic. Well, they're basically pissed off at Jesus' death. Uh, see that, where he steps on the ground and there's actually worms in the soil? Those worms are what become the penis vagina snakes later on. There's a sentence you don't think you'd have to utter very often. All of these are actual pottery. They're done with a very specific glazing. Um, and they look absolutely beautiful if you see one in real life. Um, and I have at a comic convention. Funny enough, it seems like the right place for it. Um, yeah, they're actually a type of pottery, and it's like this metallic glazing on them, and it looks beautiful. Um, HR Giga diagrams. Giga did have input in the film, but he was getting quite elderly. He has, of course, since passed on. Um, I don't know why there's a random green crystal there. Um, Would have been great if it actually had something to do with the film. This slime, black slime oozing around in the top of the um, jar. The way they did it was it's actually cornstarch in water. And they just vibrate it. And vibrating it, because it's a very um, high viscosity liquid, causes these little tendrils to come up out of the top of it. So cornstarch and water. Try it at home if you want. And then they just have a pump hooked up to it and just put more fluid in to get it to ooze over. How simple, right? So, yeah, funny enough, they go into the room and they find out, oh, there's a storm coming, you know, movie coincidental timings. It happens. It feels a little bit cheap, but... It does look beautiful. Do you think the atmosphere in that room would be stale after 2,000 years? No? I'm glad they have their uh, shrink wrap vacuum bags. I believe they got those off the shopping channel. See, Vicar's character, in a lot of ways, is like Sigourney Weaver in the first Alien. She doesn't want to let them back aboard if they've got any contaminants. If there's any danger to the ship, she will close the doors. It's not really her... <laughs> it's not really her responsibility to make those decisions. It's the captain's. You know, um, the captain's in charge of the ship. Even in the Navy, the admiral on the ship, maybe his flagship, the captain, ultimately the one who still makes the calls. So you can see the worms in the black goo. That's going to come back and haunt them later, right? Stop parking your vehicles so far away from shit. So this this storm here is supposed to be like, like a Category 5 oh, stood, oh, cyclone or worse, you know? Yeah, there's that lovely skull on the temple. Not foreboding, right? I've been through Category 5 cyclones before. Um, when I was living in Townsville, we had Cyclone Yassi come through. Um, that was a huge storm. Um... The tips of it were touching each end of Queensland, and Queensland, just for those who are curious, is about 3,000 kilometres from side to side. It was a massive fucking storm. Um, I was still in the army at the time, and they told us that the Jungle Warfare Centre, which is one of the most miserable places in the army, got wiped out by the storm. Oh, tears were shed that day. <laughs> fucking people were cheering. Alright, so yep, she gets knocked out in the wind and this fuckwit thinks that somehow he's going to rescue her um, in a sandstorm on a quad bike. I think you're dreaming, if anyone's ever been in a sandstorm. Um, I was in one, uh, oh fuck, was in Northern Territory or South Australia? I was right on the border between the two. Out in, um, out in the desert here in Australia. And yeah, sandstorms are shit. You, you, you think it's just like like dust like you won't be able to see but now nah, when the sandstorm hits you it's kind of like being hit with a pressure washer like a car wash you know this water just hits you and it's just just 
or the, the sand and grit hits you and it stings your skin. You know, that's why people cover up and wear the, like goggles and stuff. It's not because um, uh, that they can't see. It's because it fucking hurts. <laughs> so David quite selflessly, selflessly uh, rescues Shaw and Holloway here. She's all whimpering and stuff. I don't know why. Like She should feel pretty safe at this point. So... I suppose it was selfless of Holloway to come and rescue her as well. Um, although he did a shit-ass job of it, so... So these guys are decontaminating the area somehow with flamethrowers. Look at that, the robot boyfriend's doing a real better job than the real boyfriend. Who is just chastising her. Where's Milburn and Fatfield? What, nobody radioed them when they were still in there that whole time? The world's worst cartographer. Or geologist. If only we parked the spaceship 50 metres from the entrance like we could have. So I think Firefield has worked with these guys before in the fluff behind the movie. It is important to note that movies are a visual medium and the faults they have can't be explained away by things that you aren't shown in the film. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, oh, the Star Wars prequels, once you watch the Clone Wars series and stuff, makes no, because it's external to the film, right? The films are flawed. If you're not shown it in the film, it doesn't count. So I think it's uh, important just to lay that fact factoid out there for people. So again, a lovely real prop. It's interesting to note um, when they talk about writing this film that the um, obviously the elephant man in the chair, um, the space jockey, we can't keep the space jockey as that design with the trunk in that because people don't identify with things that look too different to humans unless um, you know they're like cats and dogs because everyone loves cats and dogs it's like avatar right the avatar people look like humans but with slightly cat and dog like features so they can get away with it if you have elephant man or squid people people don't identify with that right it's really hard to do like in district 9 they pull it off um, like you feel for the um, the cuttlefish in District 9, but, um... So this engineer is obviously infected with the black goo. Now, the black goo reforms DNA. That's what it does. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get an alien. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get anything in particular. It just means whatever goes in, it gets on, will change, for better or worse. Now, it, apparently, um, what the change involves depends on the mood of the person it's affecting, or the creature it's affecting. So the engineer who sacrificed himself at the start willingly, it has a certain effect on. Whereas engineers and people who are exposed to it accidentally, um, it causes a panic to, and causes, again, very different emotions, very different outcomes. Also, the amount of black goo you're exposed to. Firefield falls face first in it and gets covered and turns him into this weird zombie. This engineer is obviously decomposing um, and is freaking out at the change that affected him. And the same thing seems to happen to Holloway later on when he's infected by the black goo by David, although it was a very small amount very similar outcome to him it looked like his skin was starting to break apart and he was hurting and decomposing so similar mindsets so 
because obviously Wayland is in the pod. I don't know, that helmet kind of looks cool. No good for like a motorbike or anything like that, but yeah, it's still a cool helmet. Now David's orders um, in this film, uh, they are presented in the film. It's basically to help Wayland to achieve his goal, no matter what. Now, it's the no matter what part that's key here. Because when he infects Holway later on, he gets his consent to do it. It's a roundabout way of getting consent, but he does get it. To his android brain, it, he, he's doing the right thing. He's exploring all possible um, situations where... Um, he can find the way to keep Wayland alive because that's his programming, that's his orders. There's a lot of rumours in this movie about uh, Shelley's Theron's character also being a android, but the sheer disdain that Charles seems to have for her <laughs> um, and her very human emotions suggests that she's not. I think if she was an android, he would, and he sees her as such a failure, he would have just destroyed her. He seems like that kind of guy, um, but because she's an actual human, I'd say she's not an android. Yeah, I, I too keep my alien vases full of strange fluids in the fridge, next to the Gatorade and whatever else I keep in my fridge, dead hookers, that's a thing, right? Now, I don't know why you need a little laser shooting into DNA to test it, but it, it, it does. Whatever. The more interesting thing here I want to note is that the vase, um, or cont container, canister, I, I thought that there, it was an egg originally, or that that might have been a face hugger. But why is he pulling out glass, four glass vials? of a container full of KY jelly with floating black stuff in it when all the other vases in the temple were oozing out black goo. It's, it's like it's two totally different... You know what I mean? It, it looks odd. I'm guessing this is like the, um, the glass balls holding the um, VX nerve agent in... Uh, what was that fucking movie with Nicolas Cage? Uh, the one on Alcatraz. Fuck, The Rock, The Rock, Sean Connery, Nicolas Cage, yeah, yeah, Nicolas Cage, man, uh, <laughs> you know, the VX nerve canisters in that were, were glass beads, glass anal beads full of the VX, by the way, that's not exactly how VX works, but that was back when Michael Bay made good films, you know, I think it was all downhill maybe after Armageddon, The Rock was a great film, I, I watched that just recently, actually, yeah, that holds up. If anyone can tell me how you play uh, pool or even billiards with stainless steel balls, I'm all ears. Because <laughs> I really can't tell. I'd get very confused since I can't tell what the fuck are bigs and what the fuck are smalls. But it looks cool, right? At least in like chess sets where they're all metal, they're two different colours of metal. Like, you know, my one side might be chrome, one side might be copper, or silver or gold. Or No, these ones are just all identical silver balls. So, yeah, good luck. good luck playing pool with that. Also interesting to note that the wine bottles are steel, or stainless steel, maybe even chromed. But the rich are funny, you know. Again, it is a private yacht, essentially. And you look at, like, you know, Saudi yachts when Liam Neeson isn't rescuing his daughter on them. Um, that's a taken joke. These people, you know, they have, like, fucking wine with real gold in it and stuff. So when they drink, they shit gold. I shit, I shit you not, that's a thing, right? Liquid gold, oh, not liquid gold, but tiny gold flakes in their wine, you know. It costs, like, a hundred grand a bottle. It's the sort of shit rich people do, so. Stainless steel, chrome, or 
fuck, even let's call it platinum. Why not platinum bottles of wine? Uh, I don't think platinum's an inert metal though, so that probably not a good thing. Silver you wouldn't want to use um, to store wine because again, it's not an inert, inert um, metal. Um, Now, in the original script, in this sort of part of the story, these dead bodies were supposed to really be noticeable that they'd been chest burst, and they were supposed to be like pseudo chest bursters, or so, sorry, pseudo face huggers um, that dropped from the ceiling to infect people. And they either looked like giant versions of the face hugger, or they looked like centipedes. A centipede face hugger, if you see the artwork for it, is creepy as fuck. And um, I'd love to see that in Alien Covenant, but I don't think it's going to happen. It seems like they're going with uh, more of the black goo. Um. Oh, jump scare. Jump scares are the worst thing about modern horror films. So, just putting that out there. Of Idris Elba, seriously, I know I've said it before, but fuck Hollywood needs to give this guy more parts where he's like the main character. I think the film where he gets the most screen time is probably um, work like where he gets to act, act is it, uh, Ghost Rider: Spirit of Vengeance, <laughs> another Nicolas Cage film. <laughs> Fucking Nicolas Cage, right? Do you believe he was going to play Superman at one point? That um, that blows my mind. Do forgive the traffic driving past in the background. It's not normally a busy road. Um, there's an elderly people's house down the end of the street. And yeah, normally it's only elderly people driving around. Getting around on their fucking mobility scooters and shit. You see, at this point, you, you're intrigued in the film. The film has done a great job of building suspense, building intrigue up. Um, and really, Scott is a master of this sort of filmmaking. So, um, the character of uh, Elizabeth is barren. AKA can't have children, isn't producing eggs or something, or who knows what. So, infertility is still a thing in the 2050s or 2070s, whenever this film takes place. So, um, that's a thing. Sorry to anyone out there who is barren or infertile. Apparently, you're not getting a cure anytime soon. Then again, I shouldn't be quick to judge because I haven't reproduced to my knowledge yet, so I could be barren. <laughs> I really like Numi Rapace. I think she's a, a really good actor. Um, she's good in those Girl with the Dragon Tattoo movies, or at least the first one. I haven't seen any others. Um, I can't even really remember much of the first one. I think she gets, I think she gets her tits out. Yeah, I said that. I'm fucking all four tits out. As long as it serves the plot of the movie, I should add. If it doesn't actually contribute to the film, I don't need to see it male part of me wants to see it, but, you know, boobs are boobs, same as dick, you know, you can get your dick out if it suits the film, if it needs to be out, but otherwise, keep it in, keep it in your pants, I was in the army for seven years, I've seen enough dick in the locker room to last me a lifetime. So this whole like little chat um, is again Ridley Scott, you know, doing his God bother thing. You see, typical fucking woman logic right here. He's talking about, you know, engineers can create life, anyone can create life. He's talking about, you know, scientifically, you, can, you know, the tools are out there to create life. And she's like, having a big sob, I can't create life, I'm barren. <laughs> Why? Why would you take him out of context like that? You're playing the emotional card right now, you fucking asshole. Women, man.
Guys don't do that shit. Like, if this is two guys having a conversation, the guy's like, you know, well, anyone could create life, like, if they've got the technology. The other guy wouldn't be like, I'm infertile. <laughs> You're an asshole. He'd be like, yeah, yeah, man, if you've got the technology. Because, obviously, it's two completely different things, whether you're biologically capable or whether you're using technology to achieve a goal, right? I don't know what she finds attractive in that guy either, but then again, who knows? I think he's an asshole. Charlize Theron, of course, another fantastic actor or actress. I'd like to see her and Idris um, play against each other more. I think they're both spectacular actors and, you know, probably probably get a very good movie out of them. Much like uh, Her, a uh, movie with Jacqueline Phoenix and uh, Scarlett Johansson. When you put two really good actors together... Um, you can really, you can really get something even out of the most mediocre script. The person who he references is originally owning the uh, little accordion that he's got. Um, his big song was, um, "If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with," and he. Obviously plays that little diddly right before he goes to Bone Charlie's. Which, let's face it, I think not many straight males would pass up the chance to. There's actually a deleted scene of these two later on in the film, um, when it comes to it, I'll bring it up. Uh, creepy pyramid skull. Now, if you, the one you can see these kind of storms pretty often with silica dust and that being flung around at incredibly 200 km an hour, you know, high speeds, you know, that's 180 mile an hour. Well, I'm sorry, that's 120 mile an hour, 200 kilometers an hour. Yeah, wouldn't that wear away that pyramid like really fucking quickly? I think that's a bong in his suit. I'm not quite sure though. Whether it's just regular tobacco or chuff. Chuff is, of course, slang for marijuana. I don't know um, if that one translates in other languages too well, but yeah, chuff is one of Australia's many slang terms for weed. Now, again, um, you're not talking about the world's smartest scientists. You're talking about the ones who are willing to go four years away from Earth with the chance of dying because they love money. Mm, the captain's not on watch because he's getting his dick schlocked. So obviously he's not hearing their transmission. Now, I don't know many naturalists, but this guy apparently is a biologist. How many biologists do you think go up to snakes in the wild? cobras and then just go oh I'm going to pat you on the face so as far as I'm concerned this guy gets everything that's coming to him deserves everything you know it's like that movie Wolf Creek that lovely Australian film where uh, John Jarrett who used to be on a kids TV show <laughs> funny enough where he's like a backpacker murderer and where the um, this is all practical by the way yeah, where the, the chicks knock him out at the end of the movie and they just run off without killing him. Yeah, I'm all for him killing them at that point because they've given up their chance to live. So yeah, plastic arm, great effect. You know, it's just a rubber snake wrapped around his arm and cuts it off, right? Now here, 
that's all practical effects. Now that is a digital effect. Where it starts to regrow the head from that point on, it's a digital effect. And he, oh, as the actor, um, digital effect. And this is all digital effect. See, it was only the second half there where it had to actually move around the person and things like that, where it became a real effect. Uh, sorry, a, a uh, digital effect. Everything up to that point was practical. Yeah, this gun here. Now, I imagine the ship would have a doctor. Most ships, most spaceships should have a doctor, since most real ships have a doctor. If you saw like a s something crawling around in your eyeball, wouldn't you tell someone? Especially since you're on an alien world, I'd be more on the lookout for things than more than usual. Who the fuck sleeps sideways across a bed? Cool visual effects. Lovely Australian wildlife. I could totally just bullshit the Americans right now, couldn't I? Yeah, mate, that's the fucking Jarrah Jarrah bird. It's uh, a vicious meat eater, known for taking small children. <laughs> oh, I've pranked a lot of Yanks in my time. It's a very, very uh, loving relationship. The more you shit on someone, the more you like them. That's the Australian approach. Treat them mean, keep them keen, am I right? Interesting point in the movie. With the, uh, the captain and a fair few of the crew heading into the caves. Oh, now they can bring a car into the cave, by the way. Maybe you think they should have done that at the start. Maybe they would have gotten out quicker to the ship when they uh, had that big storm approaching, you know, because they wouldn't have to walk out. They could have driven out the whole time. No? Okay. Just me. Nitpicking. Nitpicking again because I'm an asshole. It's a reasonably well constructed film, though, script wise. Um, the worst two writers in Hollywood who seem to get it keep keep getting employed are uh, Robert Orsi and Alex Kurtzman, who did like Star Trek, Star Trek in Darkness, a whole bunch of films. Um, those guys are terrible screenwriters. <laughs> They're very successful, terrible screenwriters, but. When they write their films, the way they approach it is they come up with key scenes that they want to include. And then everything that happens between those key scenes is join the dots. Whereas a good screenwriter, one thing will lead to another, leads to another in a natural progression. So that's just a bit of filmmaking mouse for people. Um, this film, at the end here, from this point on, feels very much like things happen because one thing needs to lead to another needs to lead to another it's not always a natural progression whereas up to this point it was a natural progression so I just thought that was worth noting so for example I know Wrigley Scott said he wanted to see the Ori that's the like floating um, solar map or stellar map Floating in the in the air of the, of the throne room here, the pilot's chamber. Him wanting to see that um, that was thrown in. Now it's not an actual story point because it actually doesn't lead to anything. You see, everything he needs to learn in this room, he learns in the chair, about the chair, and from the hologram of the crew getting in the chair and finding the 
uh, engineer asleep. The whole floating map above him, though, doesn't actually teach him anything in particular. It just shows him a map. See? That's uh, filler for the sake of it. So see, like the engineer before, um, his face is starting to change, starting to be discoloured. You're starting to see veins beneath the flesh, that kind of thing, like that engineer's head. Yeah, see, the captain's got a brain. Don't touch the foreign shit. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't take a sample of what's in the vases. Especially since they already found it leaking when they first came in. Now this scene is like the, uh... Like when the chest burster happens in the first movie, the original Alien. They didn't actually tell the cast what was going to happen with uh, Milburn's corpse. So, uh, Kate Dickey, the actress, um... When she's looking at him, she didn't realise what was going on. She saw this really fine string going down his throat. And she's like, oh, what's that? And a second later, they pulled the string and outshot this fucking penis snake straight at her. And that was her actual reaction. <laughs> she's like, what? <laughs> uh, very much reminds me of the crew on the Nostromo. Um, the original alien, you know, Ridley Scott. He'll tell you what's going to happen in the scene. Like the actors know they don't go in completely blind. It's just what happens um, is still unexpected. How it happens. So it's fantastic. So again, much echoing the first Alien, the captain is out on the spacewalk, bringing back the infected crew member, and the. Ripley-like character, who's not Ripley in this case, is on the ship saying, you're not breaking quarantine, you're not coming on this ship. And the captain is trying to get them on the ship still. Open the door, wet him on the ship, that kind of thing. It's like poetry, it rhymes, as George Lucas would say. These little engineer egg things that David's pressing, or Michael Fassbender's character, looks, um... They look very much like the gel pads under your mouse pad on the computer. <laughs> I find those things really comfy. I have one at work um, for my work computer. Do you reckon that chair would be comfy? That egg chair? I reckon it would be. So again, everything he needs to learn in this scene... Um, is these holographic engineers. The actual um, map they bring up is not relevant to the plot of the film. I don't know why they're using a flute here to activate the ship. It seems a bit strange, but whatever. Also, their whole te hologram tech is inferior to ours. And they've got, what, a couple hundred million year head start on us? <laughs> I just think that's worth pointing out. Well, it's funny, though. Some scientists reckon that um, certain organisms on this planet are not foreign. Oh, sorry, they're not um, native to Earth. They're foreign. Fungus. Fungus, some scientists believe, is brought here from another world either on comets or asteroids or something. So yeah, all this uh, floating map, um, the Ori, as they're called, uh, floating around um, Michael Fassbender, is only here because really Scott thought it would look visually interesting. And he's a visual director, so, you know, that's that's fine. For those who are wondering, um, it is a weird feeling doing a commentary because you're trying to constantly keep talking and um, keep the commentary interesting um, while trying to watch a film at the same time that you're interested in <laughs> and to actually put in useful stories or facts. 
I also want to know how he's interacting with the hologram at the moment. So, <laughs> I don't know. Is that Jarrah Jarrah bird again in the background? Them and the dingoes, they work together to take them babies. So here he, of course, finds an engineer in Quarho sleep. So obviously, this is supposed to be a similar ship to the crash derelict out of the original Alien film, but is different. The pods um, that are modelled into there's four pods modelled into the set here were not actually present um, in the original set. Everything else was though. Oh, actually no. The, the other pilot's chair that's also modelled that David was just sitting in was not there in the original Alien. So, see Holloway's flesh is changing. You can see the veins coming out. The, the corruption in his flesh. Um, the gene stealer infection, I suppose one might say. Yeah, yeah. Those Yamago gene stealers, they're very dangerous. So here he is. You can see him decaying just like the engineer. And the captain is asking them to open up the ship just like an alien. It's like poetry. The rhymes. Every stanza. George Lucas joke. Apparently using the flamethrower really freaked out Charlie's. I'm curious what he turned into. That's what I want to know. Would his head explode like the engineer? I mean, the engineer was dead. And I'm guessing that's why his head actually exploded. Or would he turn into like a... a, a an alien much like Firefield becomes? I don't know. I'm just curious. Well, what I want to know is, like, why choose the fire, which is, like, one of those horrible possible deaths, when he could have just, like, taken his helmet off, and thanks to the CO2, rather painlessly asphyxiated in a few minutes. Because it's colourless and odorless, you wouldn't choke on it as such. You'd just get lightheaded, dizzy, uh, headache, blurred vision, and then you'd pass out, um, and then die. You know, it's not like, um... Because apparently the, the planet's like CO2 and carbon monoxide are the two main gases in the atmosphere. It's not like it's ammonia or something. It's not like it's going to burn your throat to inhale. So, just wanted to point that out. There's only 30% carbon, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide content. So, it's high enough to kill, for sure. Like, oh, what is it, 12%? Something like that's high enough to kill. So yeah, why not just that approach? Just take off the helmet, suffocate death, and then burn the corpse. Problem solved. But instead he's like, yeah, fuck it, flame me. That's going to be the way I want to go. <laughs> I can tell you this, that is not the way I'd want to go. I burnt myself many times. Um, random fact, when I was uh, 20 years old, not even maybe 19, and an apprentice, my welding instructor... Um, Old Mr. Fronfelder, very old <laughs> welder, very old welding instructor, gave me a piece of um, steel. Um, he comp he had these old hands that were like leather gloves, you know. They were almost always black, like he'd been rubbing them in motor oil and cracked like leather gloves. And he picked up this steel plate that he'd been welding a moment earlier, just barehanded, picked it up and handed it to me. And my brain saw him picking it up. And I just grabbed it out of his hand. He had been welding it a few seconds earlier. The thing was like 800 degrees Celsius still. Uh, that's, I don't know, probably like 1500 Fahrenheit or something. 
So as soon as I fucking grabbed this steel, it just melted most of the flesh on my right hand. <laughs> it fucked me. And, and it stuck to my skin. Stuck to my hand. And I'm shaking this piece of steel. And I'm, well, I wasn't screaming my tits off, but I was like, fuck. <laughs> shaking it. And then it eventually flew off and took a fair amount of my skin with it. Um, this steel plate. And yeah, being burnt to death, I imagine, would be pretty fucking painful uh, from having had that experience. So again, David's very callous here and sedates her, but again has been told um, his orders are find any means to cure Wayland, no matter what. And to David, this is just, alright, we'll see what happens with whatever she gives birth to, might hold the cure for Waylon, cure for death, old age. So uh, that's why he just sedates Shaw and puts her to sleep and he's very clinical and cold about it. Although he seems very antagonistic as a character, he's not overly... Um, It's because he's blunt and to the point. You know. Doesn't quite get social norms of humanity because programming is close, but it's never going to be perfect, you know. Or it might be, but not in this film. <laughs> why would anyone... Why would anyone be on that table? It looks like one of the most... I slept on concrete a few times, on just solid concrete, and it was pretty fucking uncomfortable, and that bed doesn't look like it's much better. So, I would say this is the best scene in the film here, coming up. I think we all remember the scene after it, after she has their space abortion, when she walks out in like her underwear with blood all over her hands, leaving marks on the wall as she goes. To, it was in the trailer, and people were really wondering what was that was about. That was a great trailer to this film, wasn't it? That's that's what's got me worried about Alien Covenant, and Alien because of Alien Covenant is why I'm doing this as my uh, first commentary. I watch that trailer and I'm like, ooh, oh, you can draw this, this, and this conclusion. But it's Ridley Scott films. The conclusions you draw are often very different to the final product. So, look at episode one from Star Wars. That That's a great example. Now, those bandages that she's wearing as clothes, it looks like it. Why would anyone choose that as underwear? I, I wouldn't. Yeah, so, um, yeah, look at the Star Wars prequels. Episode 1 had a fantastic trailer. The Phantom Menace, you're all like, oh, wow, this looks amazing. And, and of course, it, it, it wasn't. <laughs> so she's got, I, I guess it's like, um, like EpiPen type thing, but it's, um, full of general anesthetic. Not a general anesthetic. What do they call it? Local, local, that's the stuff. I'd be a bit worried, though, using as much local as she uses, even though she's obviously in a lot of pain. So there's very little digital manipulation done here of her body. A lot of it's physical. Um, she's actually a belly dancer, Nomi Rapace. So a lot of um, the movement of her stomach is all her. The CG in the scene is actually the robot arms. The robot arms themselves are CG. <laughs> I just have this image in my mind of this being like that, um, like an arcade game. You know those ones with the pinching machine. You pick you, every time you perfectly pick up something, and because the machines are rigged, uh, they they're legally allowed to be rigged. It drops it. It's only got to like be successful one in fifty times, I think. Yeah, because the machines are rigged, I can just imagine it just dropping this back in her. <laughs> I 
Alright, so, at this point, the creature is held in a condom, and they burst the condom, which is what just happened, right? And it's actually got wires going into it that go up through an actual mechanical arm that's holding the squid at the moment. So, that's all practical what it's doing, as you can probably tell from its movement. And yeah, it's all done through wires that are going up through the arm above, all hidden out of view. Ah, an unwanted child. It's a prom night dumpster baby. What a fucking great scene though, right? <laughs> I like it how it's got an umbilical cord as well. <laughs> well. Does that mean that there was a placenta in there as well? How, is she going to pass the afterbirth? What? Now one downside of this scene is that she does like... A, not make sure it's dead. And, well, B... I don't think I'd be running after a space abortion. I had my appendix out through keyhole surgery. And that still fucked me up, eh? <laughs> So, yeah, I wouldn't be running, especially with staples. And you're not talking... You know, like the staples are only holding the surface. They're not holding deep down. I mean, that's uterus deep, right? That, that laser cut. That's, you're talking probably a good inch or two through, like, muscle and, and um, fat. I know why Fifield is curled up in a ball here. Um, weird behaviour. It's creepy though how his legs are like arc back behind him and then his knees come forward over his shoulders. Originally he was going to be a different monster but Wrigley really liked the um, like they had a CG monster and stuff. And Ridley really liked the um, look of the actual makeup they did on him. Yeah, see here's the trailer shot. Her running body through the halls. This was in the trailer as well. I'm wondering if Firefield actually has acid blood, because they do shoot him a few times. I love that spacesuit. That's so retro 60s sci-fi. It was so cool. <laughs> I hope they've got those in uh, Alien Covenant. But yeah, they shoot him several times. He's lit on fire. Does he have acid bugs? It doesn't appear to be. So are they like laser pistols or something? Or I don't know. They look cool. You'd think that like, the truck didn't crush his skull. That wheel went over his skull. I've seen people run over by trucks before, and usually it pulps them. So whatever he's become is tough enough to take at least eight tons of truck. So that's impressive. Some more of that local. Again, I'm surprised she's not like overdosed at this point, because that's a lot of local she's shown to herself. I would imagine she's in excruciating pain, though. The fact that she walks in here and nobody's like, what the fuck? Or that no one that she, like, punched on with in the medical room before her abortion has, like, come to find her. Do you think it'd be pretty easy to, like, follow the trail of blood leading around the ship? Everyone except David's just so indifferent to her. This is the, this is the point in the film where it's all starting to fall apart. Where all the flaws are. See, people wonder why they bothered to put Guy Pierce, who's an excellent actor, um, into all this old age makeup to do these scenes. Um, it's well applied makeup, but it does look bad, right? It doesn't look convincing. Why they bothered to do that? Well, originally, you were going to see a young version of him in the film. And obviously, for his young version and old version to look similar, they wanted to use the same actor. But they cut the scenes of young him from the film, so you only get the scenes of old him in the film now. Um, when they could have used just any old bastard. Again, there's some great deleted scenes, um, some off-camera stuff with him and David. 
and Michael Fassbender, where again, Michael Fassbender just has some funny fucking jokes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I do encourage you to look up some of the deleted scenes. Um, a lot of the deleted footage does explain this movie further, so part of the flaws of this movie are due to the editing process. Um, but editing is always a hit and miss thing. Um, filmmakers want to make their films as long as they can to tell their stories because they're egotistic and production companies want to yeah, trailer trailer line we were wrong we were so wrong that's what i feel like every time games workshop brings out a release that i think is going to be good we were wrong we were so wrong <laughs> but yeah production companies want films to be shorter and yeah, people wonder why they wanted to be shorter well, it's because you can have more showings in a day at the cinema. More showings means more revenue. Yes, it's all money. It's how Hollywood works, people. You're a fucking idiot if you think otherwise. More God Botherer dialogue. God Botherer is a slang term, for those who may not be familiar with it, for... The discussion of God and people who are into God. They're a God botherer because they bother you by talking about God. There you go. She's wearing Charlie's ring. Dr. Barbecue. Now they burnt him to death on the ramp leading into the ship. So does that mean that um, his char grilled corpse is still sitting on the ramp or did they just get a broom and sweep him off? Just curious, because oh, I'm pretty sure his skeleton would have still been there, even once you burn away, like, the uniform, and maybe even, let's say maybe even um, the whole, like, suit itself, the helmet and everything. Bone is notoriously hard to burn away completely. That's why crematoriums have to run so hot. This is expository dialogue. Again, for those who aren't versed in movie terms, expository means dialogue that explains something to you. Expository. When they directly tell you something, that's expository. He's telling you, in this scene, exactly what happened earlier in the film. Shit got out, people died. It's the expository dialogue. There's actually a deleted scene um, between the flamethrower scene with um, Holloway dying and now, where there's like a a relationship between Idris Elba's captain and Charlize Theron. When I'm talking about the sex scene, I'm talking about there's a deleted scene where he um, is com comforting her because she says to him, you know, I took a man's life today and it's it's like fucked her up. And she's like shaking and stuff afterwards because she killed a person. And um, it's hinted at that he was once a soldier. Um, you know, maybe Air Force probably bombed a fucking bunch of kids in Yemen. Who knows? Um... But yeah, he um, is comforting her, and, you know, these things happen type situation. A um, bit of a shame that it was sort of removed from the movie, but again, it was removed because it's not relevant to the plot. It doesn't advance the storyline. The storyline, of course, is trying to figure out what the engineers are. That's the storyline. What are the engineers? This scene here with like Wayland and her and the daddy issues, it's not actually relevant to the plot. The only thing I guess of plot relevance is the whole fact that, you know, she thinks he should be dead of his old age and she's annoyed that he wants to live forever because it's fucking with her inheritance. You know, she wants she wants what he's got. So I suppose, but again, that's very on the nose, expository dialogue. King has his reign and then he dies. Never. Well, that's another 
storyline, other uh, trailer trailer shot. Now see how on her uniform she has a patch. You can actually buy these patches, and um, everything in this movie has these patches. The original Alien film had a lot of these patches as well. And they, like, harken back to, like, with the Air Force, the old mission patches, you know, pilots would have, like, you know, this is 88, 86 Squadron Sabres, or something like that. I don't know if 86 Squadron Sabres was actually a thing, it sounds right, probably Korean War, right? But, you know, they'd have things like mermaids on them, or rockets, or gods, all that kind of stuff. Well, for this mission, the patches are Prometheus, so it's a winged god. Um, bringing fire on the patches. And again, you can see a lot of this stuff in behind the scenes, but that kind of patches and micro-detailing is, is stuff that makes a great film. Um, the Hobbit, Lord of the Rings films, they're full of it as well. You know, um, like with the Rohan. Rohan's a great example. Look at the Rohan armour in uh, Lord of the Rings. You know, they've got like horses on the king's armour, charging horses and things like that. It's just beautiful. Dwarven armor like Gimli's has all runes and geometric patterns etched all over it. That's it's micro detailing, and it's what builds worlds. So final act of the movie. Obviously, they want to um, meet the engineers. She says what everyone's thinking. He says what everyone's thinking. That's great. <laughs> How do you know Holloway wasn't infected by what's in the air? He wasn't. And she's like, you son of a bitch. You know, because you did it. And, and that is the opposite of expository dialogue. That's showing, not telling. And that's the way movies are supposed to work. Again, if you get the chance to see one of these vases in real life, or see the pottery technique, I suggest it because it is fantastic. They look fantastic in person. Um, I'd love to get one um, just to decorate my house. Even a couple of them. Put them in the yard. Preferably without the black ooze coming out of them, turning my fucking dog into a monster. But you know, these things happen. Ooh, do you remember... Oh, I remember. I remember Alien. It's not as on the nose, though, as, um... Not as on the nose as something like Rogue One was. So, this actual set here, um, served two purposes in the movie. The central dais that he's walking on at the moment, Michael Fassbender, was removed and they covered the floor in dirt and used it as the um, pod chamber, egg room, I don't know what you want to call it. The room with the giant stone head in the middle of it where the hammerpeds attack and where Charlie gets, oh sorry, where Charlie like goes down, where Milburn gets killed, that room, yeah, same same set. Because, the, the, you know, they couldn't afford, to, even with a movie this big a budget, can't afford to constantly build new sets, right? So. They redress the set. Same walls, different floor. A lot of movies are like that. Like, um, Sheob's Lair in, um, the Lord of the Rings films was another set. They're, they're great films. The, I love special features behind the scenes and director's commentaries on movies, so that's where I get a lot of this, this shit from. The actual people who, who did them. So, this actor here in the prosthetics is a guy called Ian White. Uh, not well enough known by people, considering he's been in a lot of movies. And he's a fantastic suit actor. Suit actors are a very hard thing to come by. Uh, probably the most famous suit actor was uh, Kevin Peter Hall, um, who played um, the Predator in the first two Predator films. Ian White here actually played the Predator or Predators in AVP and AVP 2. Um, he was the giant in 300 who has the fight with Leonidas. Um, he's been in quite a few things. 
Um, they pick him because he's good in suits and he's fucking huge. <laughs> Funny enough, though, doesn't doesn't play Chewbacca. Um, the current uh, Force Awakens movie they actually had some young bloke playing Chewbacca. Um, they only got the original actor in to do a few scenes. Just wanted to note that. Because the original Chewbacca actor can pretty much not walk anymore. And for the love of God, I can't remember his name and I'm not even going to try. So, again, this is a scene that has been cut down. But basically, the engineers do not like artificial life. So that's why they kill him, or kill David. Um, because it angers them. So, with the engineers, the thought behind it was, well, because he originally talked in the deleted scene, actually has a proper, proper conversation with them, in this big booming voice speaking this um, pre-language. But really, Scott's thoughts was the engineers are so big and massive that you'd just be strong. You don't have to hit. You're just so big the, and powerful that you can just crush things, throw things, and it will hurt them. Much the same as like an elephant. You know, an elephant is just so big and powerful that, you know, it can flip cars and crush vehicles. and um, Or an adult, an adult human next to a child is so big and strong. Like, you know, you can pick a kid up with one hand, can't you? Well, it's the same sort of thing. You don't need to hit kids to hurt them. You could, you know, maybe, sounds horrible, you could grab like, a kid's arm and squeeze it tight and it would hurt them. Well, same thing. The engineer is just this big creature doesn't need to punch you he doesn't need to choke you he can just he has the strength that he can just push you and it will hurt and here's of course a trailer shot um the big piston the space jockeys um driving implement i think i was i was a little kid when i saw the first alien like my family had a very lax attitude towards these kind of movies which probably fucked me up as an adult but um i used to think this was some sort of space gun I know it's not, um, <laughs> but I was like six years old when I saw the first Alien, um, read into that how you will. Fuck, did that scare the crap out of me though, that was fantastic. I can't wait to do that to my kids, give them fucking nightmares. I'm the Chaganaw, bitch! So yeah, the whole suit that he's wrapped in um, is an exosuit. Funny enough, I just noticed that whooshing noise that happens there. The wait, I oh, know I did that terrible. There's like this whooshing noise as the air is flowing through the the chambers. It actually, sounds just like the quickening. The final quickening from the end um, of Highlander 1, where the Kurgan um, is beheaded, and you can hear the ghosts howling as they escape out of his throat, or the souls, or whatever it is, you know? Yeah, it sounds like the exact same sound effect. You get a lot of sound effects that are repeated in Hollywood, like um, the Indiana Jones punch sound effect is a really good one. Um, the Wilhelm scream. Everyone knows the Wilhelm scream. If you don't, just just Google it. Wilhelm scream. Wilhelm, because it's in every fucking like Lucasfilm movie and a lot of Fox's films. Everyone uses the Wilhelm scream at some point. More trailer shots. trailer shots. I love it. The thing with trailers is they, they take things out of context and they can often misrepresent a movie because you're trying to make people interested, curious to come see the movie. And if you look at the original Alien trailer, it is so, so different to the way we look at trailers today. So we're coming up to probably the most silly scene in the film. Um, the rolling croissant. 
if you want to see how professional an actress Charlize is, there's a deleted scene, or not deleted scene, sorry, a, um, a blooper um, of her as she's trying to get into the escape pod, and she's, like, putting on her spacesuit, and she can't get the helmet on, it's, like, backwards, she's holding it backwards, and the whole time she doesn't break character, and it's, like, it's painful to watch, almost, <laughs> and she's, like, come on, ah, oh, damn you, ah, oh, come on, just in character the whole time, trying to put this helmet on, and then, um, yeah, so this scene here, <laughs> where she's, she's running, she's, like, god damn you, and she, and all the way up to, like, struggling to put this helmet on then eventually getting the helmet on and getting into the escape pod all that um all that um yeah professional actress you know anyone else would have got like 10 seconds into it and be like oh fuck cut out and started laughing but nah she she follows through man because hey it could have been a take that the director liked or used and and that's the mark of a professional so I told you this is a movie commentary. I'm gonna I'm gonna be very on point. Yeah, lifeboat's away, but um the thing lands like shit. <laughs> it's got thrusters and Yeah. Gets completely fucked up, so you'd hate to be inside that lifeboat, wouldn't you? Escape pods are always a funny thing in movies. They're never in feasible locations. I think Star Trek's the only movie series or TV series where the escape pods have been in a feasible location. You know, it was like hundreds of meters from the bridge. I think. I think if you if you've got a problem with um, your spaceship, space is very unforgiving. Like you get explosive decompression. You won't have time to run 200 meters to get to your escape pod. <laughs> That's a pretty good special effect. Sorry, visual effect. ship looks beautiful. I believe it was a Zed brush um, that it was painted in. Um, a Russian artist um, painted the derelict for the movie. Um, did all this micro detailing because that thing has a ton of surface texture. It would have been a prick to render in a computer. Because um, you think how much detail would have gone into drawing that to give like all the shadow, all the depth. Again, it's Wrigley Scott it's fucking seamless. That that guy who rendered that, fuck. That must have been hundreds of hours on that one object. And of course, the Prometheus school of running away from things. Roll five meters to the left and you'll be fine. Or you can keep running in a straight line. And, and it hurt me to watch in the cinema. I can assure you. I sat there with my mates and I was like, what a load of bullshit. <laughs> and so goes Charlie's. Sounds like metal. I think it's important to note that the ship is metal. Sounds like metal. And when it does land on that rock, it creates a lot of sparks. So no matter how advanced the engineers are, they're not building with carbon fiber. The fact that it sparks orange sparks means that yeah, the rocket hit was iron pyrite. Or the ship itself contained iron. Now, I've seen it, people complain before about when she does, um, how she's running low on oxygen when she gets into the, um, escape pod or escape bedroom. I don't know what you want to call it. That, um, when, when she gets in there that, um, she's running incredibly low on oxygen. And then how come when she gets out five minutes later, she's at full oxygen? Well, I believe that, um, the spacesuit, in all likelihood, contains a compressor. That's that simple. Gets into an oxygen-filled room, automatically just compresses some air. 
Makes sense. That, or she grabbed a different something on the way out, although she never... I guess the helmet doesn't have an air supply to have to be in her suit. But there's quiet air compressors out there, like the ones we use for hobbying, uh, for airbrushing. Those those are quiet compressors a lot of the time. I'm, my ones are not. My one's fucking loud. I use an industrial compressor, but... I imagine that as soon as she got inside, it just started sucking in cool, clean air. So again, this whole pod escape shuttle that you're meant to be able to live a couple of years in just got completely fucked up doing its job. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, not very good, right? All these things on the ground are books. All the walls on one side, the side that's hidden by camera at the moment, is our library. Now this is a deleted scene as well where the engineer comes in snooping around, um, starts watching the girl playing the violin on the screen, twisting his head like a dog when he hears a weird noise, and um, Shaw attacks the engineer and embeds the axe in his side, um, and he doesn't really care. Because again, look at the scale, the axe head's tiny next to his big body. Um, for a human, it'd probably feel like getting stabbed in the side with a Stanley knife. Wouldn't fucking tickle, but... And, you know, it's not going to be that big a hole in the end of the day, is it? So he just throws her across the room, reefs the axe out, and throws it aside. And then throws her up against the wall, and he's going to kill her. Um, and that's when she releases the squid, the trilobite. I do apologise for any weird clicking, clacking, or scraping sounds you heard throughout the commentary or the last few episodes of our show. Um, the microphone, I don't actually have a stand for at the moment. It's broken, so. This whole thing with the engineer and um, fighting the trilobite, um, how he's got his feet up against the door, Ridley came up with that idea again, um, being the director that he is. And what a fantastic idea, because it really shows, you know, like, it sells it. It sells that he's fighting, even though the actual actor is on um, wires, doing wire work, and he's fighting a CGI monster. So there's nothing actually there on the day. Um, the fact he's got his legs on the wall and he's like pushing up with his strength, that's, that's, that's fantastic, you know? Because it sells it. It's little things like that that sell a movie. What a creepy fucking creature. That's a fantastic looking fucking piece of CGI work, isn't it? See, I can, I can praise CGI when it's used appropriately, and that was used appropriately, because that sort of thing is very hard to get a puppet to do, and it's a lot harder than using CGI. George Lucas would have, you know... That's great. It's a wrap. Too many practical effects. ILM's got this. So obviously Alien Covenant takes over from this movie somehow or another. David's been rebuilt, it looks like. I don't know how. I don't imagine that she has the resources to rebuild a fucking android, but maybe she, I don't know, maybe she reconnects his old body to him. It'd be great to see him, like, like Eidolon, after he gets his head reattached, he's not quite right. You know, he shambles a bit and shuffles around and gets nervous twitches in his body because his head was, you know, decapitated. It'd be great to see if, um, David's severed head is like that. Where, um, once he's, um, if he's in the Alien Covenant, um, that he twitches and stuff, like he's been reconstructed by her that'd be that'd be great wouldn't it and really it's the sort of guy who probably would pull that sort of thing off so well that's convenient how the fuck did that get there you know i'm gonna say that it was the one that was blown there earlier in the storm blown away from the ship let's just go with that hey the the quad bike that is
his voice has gone funny. Um, that's a audible cue that the um, Foley artists and the sound editor um, took from the original Alien film, how when Ash is decapitated, his voice modulation changes, because obviously it's just, you know, he's fucked. <laughs> What they did to get the effect was um, they gargled water, and then they just filter his da- Michael Fassbender's voice, David, um, and the water gurgling noise together. It's pretty basic sound editing, but it's fantastic. I think the most uh, well-known sound editor is probably Ben Burt, who did um, Star Wars. You know, guy came out with the lightsaber noise and R two D two and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's a real art to it, and, um, you know, love them or hate them, but the Star Wars prequels, um, in the special features, he talks about the sound editing a fair bit, as well as in the, um, audio commentaries for them. Best Star Wars audio commentary, for those who are curious, is Empire Strikes Back, just as Empire Strikes Back is the best Star Wars film. See, I didn't take away that the engineers changed their mind. I just took it away that they got fucked up before they could carry out their cleansing of the human race. They saw us, for whatever reason, as a failed experiment. And so they um, went to kill us off. And then this black goo got out of control. And that's why they canned the mission. Kind of like a nuclear strike on Earth. If the nuclear bomber never got off the ground, you know, of course it didn't carry out its strike. Doesn't mean they didn't want to strike you. <laughs> so, Alien Covenant, apparently it's a colony ship. It goes to colonise this world or something. And they find the ship that Numi replace this one that's taking off. They find this ship um, crashed onto this planet that they go to, and I believe that the goo, this is my conjecture, has escaped into the environment around the crashed ship. So, finally, the little tacked on bit at the end of the film, and it does feel tacked on, is the, uh, the deacon, as they call it. It looks like a like a deacon or a bishop's pointed hat at the church. Um, just chest bursting, this massive, massive chest burster. But it's what they call an ultramorph as well, because um, the idea is it's it's like a <coughs> part of me. It's it's like a superior version of the um, alien because it's not from human DNA. It's from an engineer's DNA. Will it be in Alien Covenant? I don't know. Probably not, since from the way this has been edited, this is not on the ship um, that's leaving. So, so there we have it, everyone. The Outer Circle's first commentary track. Um, Thank you everyone who listened to me go on and on and on for (laughs) two hours. Um, I hope you like it. Um, Please let me know if you want to actually hear more commentary tracks. I'll probably do them anyway. Uh, Next commentary track I plan on doing is probably Alien. Um, It was a lot of fun. It's funny trying to, again, uh, come up with things to talk about for two hours, but uh, you stuck with me and hopefully... I gave you some insight into the film, and um, hopefully you got something out of it. So that brings us to the end of the commentary, and I hope to see you all next time.